Normally, on Remembrance Day, we think back to World War I and World War II. However, in a house that traces its origins to the 1830s, it is worth taking some time to look back to the 19th century and remember the contribution of soldiers who were once garrisoned in Victoria Park. There is a romance to the garrison era in London. It brings to the imagination images of officers dancing into the night with beautifully dressed bells, the excitement and danger of military steeplechases, and military theatricals, where redcoats put on petticoats and played women's roles with full melodramatic fervor. However, behind these stereotypes lies a deeper narrative. How officers from abroad brought cultural and economic impetus to a town on the frontier. The British military came prepared to put down rebellions and quash border incursions. Instead, they left a legacy not of war, but of culture. Painting the first views of London, organizing balls and steeplechases, and building London's first theater, the Theater Royal. I am joined today by three actors who will be representing figures from London's history. In 1837, some citizens were dissatisfied because they wanted more democracy in the government of Upper Canada. A group of them, led by Alexander Mackenzie, planned to march on Toronto. Their rebellion failed and many rebels were imprisoned or executed. Mackenzie had a price put on his head and fled. Exiled rebels from the United States began agitating. We burned one of their ships, they burned one of our ships. Things were starting to get hot and heavy. This gives you a sense of why it is the British were worried. After the rebellion of 1837, the British sent garrisons of soldiers to what was then known as Upper Canada, to Brockville, Kingston, Toronto, Hamilton, St. Thomas, and London. The very first regiment, the 32nd, came down to London from Halifax. Now, I, I used to take the bus from Ottawa, Ontario, to London, Ontario, and that's eight and a half hours. First of all, these guys came in from Halifax, and second of all, they came in on slaves in January. I was trolling around the National Archives website, as you do, and I ran across a couple of, a couple of pictures of people traveling by sleigh uh, uh, from the 1830s. And I'll show them to you now just to give you a sense of what it might have been like to do that. Lots of treacherous crevasses and difficult hills and weariness and breakdown. Till they finally arrived in London, Upper Canada. Sir James Alexander describes a similar journey into London. We continued our march through the forest with partial clearings and small wooden houses of settlers here and there. The road was sandy, but we were refreshed with the smell of the turpentine from the trees and by the shade which they cast across our way. Subsequently, we came to larger clearings and the heat and dust were rather overpowering. A corps leaving London had, on this last march, 50 men fall out and some died from strokes of the sun. The black patent leather of their caps occasioned the mischief. A white or drab crown would be an improvement for soldiers' caps. A riding party and then a military band advanced to meet us. This was Colonel and Miss Wetherall, some officers of the Royal Regiment and the band of that old and highly distinguished corps, sent forward to play us into our new quarters at London, where we also found excellent breakfasts prepared for both our officers and men by the gallant and considerate royals. Mrs. Anne Port recalled the arrival of the military in London in 1838. The regulars were sent for at the first outbreak, but it took them so long to travel the distance that 
32nd came the whole way down from Halifax on sleighs, that things had pretty well quieted down before they arrived. I remember being so disappointed when I saw them march through the town, that their coats were not red. But a big soldier threw open his gray overcoat, and my small woman's eyes were delighted with the sight of the red coat, <laughs> which afterward seemed to take possession of the whole town. London in 1838 had a population of 1,000 and people. And suddenly, London had to accommodate 409 new soldiers in a town of 1,000 people. So how do you think they were going to do this? Mrs. Ann Port said. We had five of them billeted on us. Every resident was obliged to accommodate a certain number to the government secured Dennis O'Brien's new block for a barracks. The local residents would have gotten to know the men pretty well by the time they moved into their new accommodations. Which was Dennis O'Brien's block, here, next to the courthouse. Jane O'Brien, wife of Dennis O'Brien, describes the time in a letter to Isabella Crichton. I will attempt to give you a faint sketch of the times upon which we have fallen. London, since December last, has been one continual scene of confusion. Crowded with soldiers, large numbers were billeted on each house for want of barracks. And it has been but recently since we got rid of them, and arrests for persons suspected of being implicated in the outbreak were going on through the winter. Mr. O'Brien as well. He has escaped censure from all parties and has done a great amount of business with the government and has gotten nearly all his money. He has rented his brick building for barracks. Great dissatisfaction and excitement prevails in the country, and many are daily leaving. The military had a reserve of land set aside for a garrison, which included the area now occupied by Victoria Park. They built some log barracks. They built some frame barracks. And you can see here in a picture from Ainsley what the log barracks and frame barracks looked like when they were finally built. This is the view looking south at the barracks down Richmond Street. Once the soldiers got settled into their permanent quarters, things got a little dreary because the officers didn't have anyone to fight. Here's a tongue-in-cheek diary entry that was printed in the Times in 1842. There is plenty of leisure time and no temptation from without. So that, after being quartered here for a number of years, one might come forth a profound lawyer, or a deep divine, or be entitled to a diploma and write MD after his name while considering which of these pursuits to, to decide upon, fell asleep and was awoke by the last bugle for dinner, six hours afterwards. So there's another day of my life gone to waste. <laughs> so given that setup, what's a chap to do? For starts, they painted the local landscape. The artistic legacy left by the officers is important as a document of the time. Here, for instance, is George Russell Darkman, one of our important early artists, sketching. Some of the paintings he left us are quite beautiful. As you can see, isn't that gorgeous? That's a painting Darkman did with Thames River. And here's another Darkman painting. This is a very idyllic view of London. Noir. And Caddy. And you can see that it's a very popular view of London at that time from the hill looking down from the Wortley Hill with the courthouse spread out and the town below. Here's another painting that Caddy did, lovely view of Niagara Falls. John Herbert Caddy left us many such views. He was one of the officers who stayed in London because he liked it so much. In 1843, he writes, the military, 
both officers and men like Canada very well and prefer it to any other station abroad. Living is cheap and good health maintained and amusements are not wanting. Besides pleasure riding, carriage and sleigh driving, hunting and fishing, there are the picnic and evening parties, balls, occasionally a concert, and during the winter the garrison opened a public theater, officers being the chief players, assisted by the men, and the houses display a pretty lively and gay appearance with inhabitants and military together. In order to open that public theater, the military needed to secure land on which to build it. That task fell to Thomas Rayner, the commissariat officer. And to do that, Thomas Rayner would have to visit Port Talbot to ask for a grant of land. We can get a sense of what Rayner's reception at Port Talbot might have looked like from Sir James Alexander's account of visiting Thomas Talbot. In the sitting room, there was a long table, a heavy press, shelves with books, and several ancient portmanteaus. At a small fire, though it was in July, sat the colonel, occupied with his newspapers, who received us courteously and with his usual hospitality. He was a short and strong-built man with a ruddy face, an aquiline nose, and was dressed in a white jacket and trousers. We dined in a room with red paper and gilding, unusual ornaments. We had a well-dressed dish of roast meat and mashed potatoes, and a good bottle of pork. Everyone had so favorable an impression. We have dined in Colonel Talbot's house, a very wretched place. He seems altogether an odd character, priding, if not pleasing himself, in doing things unlike other people. His house, farms, and all his buildings are in ruins, as bad as any poor settler. His dining room, the only habitable part of his house, is a mere log hut washed with a little lime and water for the reception of the Duke of Richmond when passing down in 1819. The damp streaming down has defaced the walls, and the tattered, torn, and stained scattered volumes on the shelf show the man who can live nine months of the year in that misery while he passes himself off the other three at Upper Canada. So that's the man we're dealing with, Sir uh, you know, Colonel Talbot. <laughs> Colonel Talbot. Talbot. Yeah, Talbot. Thank you. The story goes that Talbot flipped a piece of land already in use by someone else over to the officers. But was that story true? And where was the theater exactly? I wanted to find out. I went to look at Talbot's original land granting maps, the ones he kept with him, and to which he carefully added the names of each settler. And what I found bears on the story better than I could have hoped. You can see here where Talbot drew a little X on the map, right at the corner of Wellington and Queens, where one London place now stands. And in the margin, he wrote, This Theater Royal. Here's what that area of London looked like in the 1840s. This is a view looking west along Dundas Street from Wellington Street. In the distance, you can see the roof of the courthouse on the left. The Theatre Royal was just north of here. Anthony Gale's public house, a great resort of the officers, apparently, was blocked to the west. If an officer were to stand at the front door of the theater, they would have been easily able to see their barracks a block to the north. This illustration of the Theatre Royal in Winnipeg gives a glimpse of what the London Theatre Royal might have looked like. An old free press staffer described the royal as follows. It was an old former frame barn that held an audience of about 200 seated with benches in the pit and with an attempt of uh, style in the box department. The first season of the Theatre Royal included performances by a young member of the militia named William Mercer Wilson. This picture shows him as an older man, wearing his regalia as the first grandmaster of the Masons Grand Lodge of Canada. The inset shows him when he was younger, 
as he might have looked when still a member of the militia. William Mercer Wilson sets the scene in a very evocative diary entry. He wrote on November 22, 1839. Frost and snow, accompanied by blue noses and icy fingers, the jingle of sleigh bells, and the appearance of buffalo robes show that cold winter has commenced. We are all alive, however, in the garrison, and everything is going pleasantly. A few faint rumors of a trip to Amherstburg have been rather startling, but as yet no order has been issued for me to move. I really hope my troop will be permitted to remain here for the winter. The country at present seems very tranquil. The people generally think that the disturbances are over for a few years. However, if this winter passes over without an affray or two, I will be greatly surprised. What is remarkable about William Mercer Wilson's diary is that he not only acted in the Theatre Royal's very first performance, he wrote about it. What? More sacks? Sorry, I, my, my error. The first amateur performance is expected will be about the 10th. The pieces selected are Wives and Sweethearts and Bombastis Furioso. I am to play Curtis in the first. As described by Mercer Wilson's diary, there were at least nine plays performed in that first season. The final performance was held on April 24, 1840. The Amateur Theatre closed for the season on Friday evening to Woodhouse. This evening's performances were Paul Pry and Love a la Mode. I think that I may now fairly imagine that I have made my last appearance as an amateur actor. It has been a good season and the theatre has been well supported. Baker, 73rd, made the farewell speech. Let me tell you about another one of those early actors. Daniel License was an artist, he was an excellent horseman, he painted the scenery for the theatre. Sir James Alexander recalls License as an officer of great talent and taste. License, of his role, License says, at London we had some very good theatricals, and I myself took charge of the theatre. License also describes his acting in Quebec. I was a smooth-faced boy then, so I was enlisted for the ladies' parts, and got great applause for my Caroline Dorman in The Air at Law, and for my Ravina in The Miller and His Men. A newspaper review of one of License's London performances said, Emma Leslie, Mr. License, Royals, wore the petticoats with an ease and grace well becoming the character. Every emotion, every gesture and movement indicated a familiarity with the peculiarities of womankind that does not fall to the lot of most men. Had we not known that he was a man, it would have been almost impossible to have convinced us of the contrary. Grave Simcoe Lee didn't have quite as much success with the ladies' parts. His father chased him off stage when he neglected to tell him he was playing a female role. <laughs> this didn't seem to stop him because he went on to become one of the most successful Canadian actors of the 19th century. He was a Broadway matinee idol and the only London civilian of that time who took up acting in earnest. There were a lot of shows put on by the officers in the early 1840s. You can see from these wonderful advertisements for the officers' productions. It's great 19th century typography. The theater was then rented to two troops of local amateurs. The first called the Gentleman Amateurs, and the second called the Shakespeare Club. These troops, thanks to the Theatre Royal, started the local amateur theatrical tradition. Which brings us to the London of 1855. London was now a city of 10,000 people instead of a city of 1,000 people. The officers, had brought, bought, the officers had brought great economic impetus to the city, as well as a newfound cultural vibrancy. And so our story ends, but not quite because Garrison Theatricals is writing a new chapter to the story. 
Last year, in collaboration with Sheila Johnson, the executive director of the Fanshawe Pioneer Village, and in partnership with the London Heritage Council, we put on a production of Isaac Pocock's The Miller and His Men. It was an unusual production because the last time it was performed in London was in 1842. So a bit of background. Having published a paper on London's Garrison Theatre, I did a follow-up presentation here at the Allen House Interpretive Centre. Joe Lella showed up. Has he showed up yet? Joe Lella showed up. There he is. Um, and not too long after that, we were sitting down for coffee talking about the plays that they had performed at the Theatre Royal. Joe and I had worked in productions together before, and we said, you know, we, we should reproduce one of those shows. And I said, why don't we see if we can find a copy of The Miller and His Men? Not only was it brought back by popular demand in 1842, but it's also a musical. Since we now live in an internet age, we were able to find and download a copy of Miller and Men from the UWO library that afternoon. We read it out loud, playing all of the parts ourselves. As we worked our way through the script over the ensuing weeks, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could use actual paintings painted by the officers as backdrops? And Joe said, that's a great idea, but all the ones you've shown me are landscapes. Where would we ever find a scene backdrop representing, let's see, says Joe, opening the script. Uh, scene one, a mill with a cottage and millers crossing the river with sacks. I said, flip, 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 flip. How about this? And we stared at this painting and said, ooh, maybe we've got something here. So we worked our way through the script. Joe would say, okay, also in scene one, uh, we need a, a desolate looking old hovel for Kelmar's cottage. And I'd go looking through my files, flip, 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 flip. Okay, how about this? Great. Okay, scene two. How about uh, a dark forest with two lonely travelers with a storm brewing? Wow. Okay, how about scene three, inside of Kelmar's cottage? <laughs> Fabulous. And scene by scene, we worked our way through the script. These images were all of London and area, yet Miller and his men was nominally set in Bohemia. However, as near as we could tell, there was nothing to the script which constrained the action to any particular place or time. We changed the names of the script to resituate it in London, Upper Canada. Bandits became rebel bandits. The local aristocracy became Officers of the London Garrison. Sheila Johnson, executive director of the Fanshawe Pioneer Village, was delighted with this move. Emboldened, we proceeded to slightly modernize the language. We found that very slight rewordings and cuts were sufficient to make the play much easier to understand for modern audiences without altering its substance. A play that an audience doesn't understand, they won't watch. Compare Kalmar's opening speech in the original. What? More sacks, more grist to the mill. Early and late the miller thrives. He that was once, he that was my tenant is now my landlord. The hovel that sheltered him is now the only dwelling of broken-hearted Kalmar. Well, I strove my best against misfortune, and thanks be to heaven, have fallen respected, even by my enemies. So, Claudine, you are returned, or stayed you so long. With our updated version. What? More sacks, more grist going to the mill. The miller thrives all day long. He was once my tenant, and now he's my landlord. This hovel that once sheltered him is now my only dwelling. Me, poor, old, bankrupt, and broken-hearted Kelmar. Well, I work as hard as I could to stave off misfortune. And now, thank heaven, at least I'm respected, even by my enemies. So, Claudine, you're back. Where have you been so long? The biggest liberty we took with the script was to jettison the original score and use Gilbert and Sullivan songs instead. <laughs> you might 
you might regard GNS as the apex of the melodramatic tradition. It has the same stock characters and the same stereotypical situations. This meant that it was relatively easy to find GNS tunes that fit the plot like a glove. Poor oh, poor the pirate sherry from Pirates of Penzance became poor oh, poor the rebel one, and so on. And this is where a little research goes a long way. Because we have the names of all of the plays, and thanks to Dan Brock, the names of all of the playwrights, we were able to track down play scripts for many of the other plays on archive.org. And put up the links on our website for possible future performance. Because of Thomas Talbot's map, we knew where the theater was. And we were able to begin the process of getting an historical plaque erected. Because we knew the original playing space was a frame barn like the one in Winnipeg, we were able to find a barn at the Fanshawe Pioneer Village that would have been very similar to the original. And because we had copies of the original advertisements, we were able to design a poster which included typographical elements from uh, and phrases drawn from the posters of the day. What I love about this story is the swords to plowshares quality it has. Fighting men for Britain make theater, not war. This happens to be a story of London in particular, but it is also the kind of story that was being replayed all over the canvas. The fact that so many plays from the period are now freely available creates opportunities for theatrical reenactment <coughs> and rediscovery wherever there were British garrisons. Here is a quick review of the steps. For your city or town, find out whether records of the plays performed there still exist. Once you have the titles, archive.org turns out to be a great source of period play scripts. Relocalize the plays to add community relevance and resonance. If possible, find out where the plays were performed. Recreate the productions either in the original playing space or in a reasonable facsimile. These could be full-fledged productions, staged readings, or radio dramas. Here is our very talented cast and creative team who brought the Miller and his men to life. We all greatly enjoyed working with the Fanshawe Pioneer Village in this production and want to particularly acknowledge the amazing support of the London Heritage Council and of Sheila Johnson, the executive director of the Fanshawe Pioneer Village. We are now casting for roles in London Assurance which was first performed in London in 1843. Please spread the word. And if you are interested in auditioning or in joining our production team, please come and say hello after the talk or drop me a note at the email below. We also invite you to check out our website at garrisontheatricals.com for a behind-the-scenes look at last summer's production and more historical background. <laughs>